Curveface prides itself in being a company that has very rigorous methods of risk analysis and has even claimed globally that they could have foreseen the credit crisis. So if you foresaw a crisis, why didn't you tell anybody there was going to be a crisis? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much for that, Lorato. I think, you know, just to position that correctly is if there's a message being portrayed, there's a communicator and a listener. And even through the crisis, it was a very difficult message to portray as to how long the crisis was going to go on for and how bad it was going to get. Businesses and banks did not want to hear the message that the crisis is here. It is not going to end until we as trade consumers do something actively about it. And that's trade differently. And that is the message that we started taking to the market in 2000, early 2008. Right. And it just wasn't heard. So how do you assess the credit worthiness of banks? Because they're under the spotlight, as we mentioned with uh, Andrew earlier, and everybody's looking at their earnings in the next uh, quarter. Everybody wants to assess whether banks are investment grade, what risks continue mm. to permeate in the system. What do you look for? Okay. If I could just take a second to position Coface Group correctly. Um, Coface is a trade solutions provider, and we right. build ourselves as a real life business partner. And the issue around real life is it continues to change. Mm. When you look at um, a trade or any type of transaction, the issue is around assessment. Now, we don't grade banks mm -hmm. specifically or countries from a sovereign debt ratio right. specifically. What we take a look at is macro and microeconomic indicators within a country, and we rate the country which would then be a good indicator of the payment possibility within okay, the country. Okay, so, so the micro forces would be uh, the banking sector for one, the mining sector in, a, in an economy like South Africa, and how do they fare? Quite well. You know, in South Africa, the, the financial sector did very well through the crisis. We were protected by a series of legislation that had been introduced into South Africa in the recent mm -hmm. years prior to the crisis. So well foreseen by the government that we needed control within the banking industry and that there was definitely abuse as far as cash, liquidity mm -hmm. and availability of credit. So the banks had been protected and came out of it quite well. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at the mining side of things, it really depends on the type of mine, the resource, the commodity involved, etc. Some fared better than others. Okay, well, South Africa apparently has a fairly good uh, credit rating internationally. I think it's an A3 uh, negative watch. And the good, we're told, is that the rule of law persists in this country. The bad is that we've got a highly indebted consumer and other forces at play. Can you just talk to us about the things yes. counting against us? Okay, well, let's take a look at the A3 negative watch first and compare that to other countries like the UK, Brazil, Chile. Um, Greece is obviously rated lower than us. Turkey is rated A4. And to put that in context, the A3 is a good rating because of exactly what you've mentioned. The governance in South Africa is very good. Transparency is there. And we feel that in South Africa, although the growth is not attractive, as attractive as it should be, in a normal emerging market, comparing ourselves to China or India, it's a stable growth and it's something that you can count on. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking for there is really the FDR rather than the hot money that's mm -hmm. flowing through the JSC. And uh, we were discussing this before the show. So when you look at the good and the bad, you have to take a look at a mix of the both. Mm -hmm. And it's the uncertainties in our market that concern us and therefore the negative watch. And we're looking to overcome some of those uncertainties before we lift that negative watch. What are those uncertainties? People are talking about the RAND at the moment. It's a talking point. And again, it depends whether you look at the glass half empty or half full. Correct. The optimists say, great, it's an indication of a strong economy. The others are say, no way, it means we can't export. We're not getting value for the commodities we export. Andrew suggested that earlier on. We're not in good stead. Okay. You've hit on exactly the point that we are concerned about is that the stability of the currency. It's the ability to judge where the currency is going to go. Why is the RAND so strong? We would, you were discussing that mm -hmm. earlier. There is no clear view on where the RAND is going to go mm -hmm. to. Should we be managing it from the Reserve Bank level mm -hmm. or should we not be managing it? And when you look at an emerging market, it's that instability that affects the risk factor in the market. In an industrialized country where you are saving and you are trading in a euro or dollar fashion, mm -hmm. nobody trades in with RAND. You have limited dollar savings in the Reserve Bank, and that's a limiter to us. So if you take all of those factors into account, um, the instability is still there as an emerging market. Mm -hmm. The growth factors are not high enough. I think if I, if, if I can add to that, I think the problem is that very often um, 
the easy fix is to say peg their end, weaken their end, but yeah. efficiencies aren't focused on, productivity Correct. is not focused on, and having a competitive economy. And I think that has to be one of the risks. You look on the labor side of things, although we've got a strong economy, the effects of the strikes, the effect of low productivity is not being felt at the moment, mm -hmm. and perhaps a flood of cheap money is maybe masking those, mm -hmm. and those have to be concerns in the long mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, you mentioned early on, Lorata, that we have a highly indebted consumer. Yeah. That's not as bad as some of the European consumers that we're taking a look at. America's debt ratio is still at 130 odd percent. Mm -hmm. Europe is above 100 percent. Mm -hmm. South Africa, we're looking at 80 percent, which is not too bad. Mm -hmm. And the, the move of the monetary spend in the consumer market has moved towards debt cancellation and towards savings. But let's talk about that South African consumer because it is an upside risk. Uh, issues of inflation come into play, um, issues of um, sustainability of jobs and whether people will be able to repay their, their debt is another one. And then also is the question of whether or not we can drive a consumerist economy because 60% of how this economy works is through the ability of the consumer to spend. Correct. If you take a look at the, the recent figures that were released yesterday from the NCR, the, the credit regulator, there has been a 33% increase in credit facilities granted over the last 12-month period. Quarter 1 to quarter 2, 2010, there was a 10% increase. We're sitting at 1.2 trillion rand in credit facilities in the consumer market. 750 million of that is in mortgage bonds. So there is an increased capacity being created right now in the market for the consumer to spend. The consumer is able to spend slightly more than they were in 2008-2009. The question that we think we faced with is have they already spent a lot of that in the six weeks of the World Cup? Right. Are we going to have a very slow Christmas from a retail point of view? Um, you know, we had our Christmas in July. So what is going to happen when it comes to December? Has the, the consumer spend yeah. already been put out there? But there's a definite trend of the consumer going out looking for that credit again. Uh, your views? Yeah, I, th I suppose you, you, you'll also start to see the interest rate cuts, which, we, which we've seen over the last um, year or so. You know, you've seen 600, 650 basis points being shaved off. Mm. Um, one just hopes that that spending is not reckless and that people don't get themselves back into those holes that they, they were in. You obviously need the consumer to buoy the economy, but at the same time, lessons need to right. be learned from the pain that we took in this recent crisis. All right, beyond the consumer and the RAND is the infrastructure issues mm. in South Africa. We were always told that we've got first class first world infrastructure, but we've got power outages here. Yeah. <laughs> Very hot topic of discussion today at our conference was sustainable energy, and there were a number of players of present at the conference that are involved with our government in discussing energy requirements and plans for the future. And it is certainly one of the hottest topics that South Africa has to face is not so much the cost of energy. We still have a very cheap electrical power uh, supply in South Africa compared to Europe and uh, other industrialized countries. But it's the availability for us to grow. If our economy were to be growing at six and a half, seven percent, we believe that we would have a serious energy crisis. Yeah. So one of the biggest infrastructure issues at the moment is no longer roads and airports, et cetera, et cetera. It has now moved to sustainable energy. And do we go coal, do we go nuclear, et cetera? And, you know, as Garth says, um, we, we saw the IMF come out, I think it was today or yesterday, with a report saying that, you know, to alleviate poverty, to tackle um, the, the social issues that we have, we need 6% plus growth. Yeah. The problem is the last time we got there, the lights literally went out. Yeah. And the problem with power supplies, it's not something that comes online this year or next year. It's a long-term yeah. project. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. we need those numbers and we need them relatively need soon. Them quickly. Garth, a final question to you. Um, the view is that economic cycles are getting shorter and shorter because crises are becoming more and more frequent. So look into your crystal ball and tell us <laughs> with all the variables that you've put forward, um, are we going to grow steadily next year? For how long is that going to happen? And when are we going to hit another bump in the road? Again, a very topical question. The, the view of COFAS Group at the moment is that we are not expecting a double dip. It has been discussed earlier in the show. We agree with that very strongly. We think that 2011 will be a growth year, although in most emerging markets we will not be comparable. We will look at the 3% mark. Europe will grow by about 1.9%, America by the 1.6, 1 1.7. 1 yeah. So the double dip will be avoided probably 2011, 2012. 2013, we are starting to feel that might start to show a little bit of corrugation, but we are not expecting a big dip. So we're expecting more sort of a longer U with a little bit of corrugation in between. Um, probably in the next three to four years. I'm not a builder with corrugation. So when we get that dip, what's going to cause no. that dip? Again, it's going to be liquidity issues. Uh, it 
will again be driven by the financial sector.